Hello and welcome to the virtual Bible study. Thank you for joining us this evening. We will study from the book of Romans chapter 4 in a while. Let me take the study first and then at the end of the study we will have time to reflect and take questions. Let us look to God in prayer. Father, we thank and praise you for this evening and we thank you for giving us the appetite to study your word. Help us to understand the revelation of your word in all its majesty. Give us deeper understanding and open our hearts and our minds to see the truth you want to communicate to us that we may know how to relate with you and worship you with all of our heart, mind and soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship the Lord by singing the song entitled, Jesus, You're My Firm Foundation. And welcome to the virtual Bible study. I believe the Lord will talk to us because he loves us. Be ensured that this study will be benefiting as God will speak to you through his word from the study tonight on the exemplary faith of a believer. We are going to learn today from Romans 4, 13 to 25. Do pay attention as I read from God's word as also displayed on the screen as you also have along with you your Bible. Romans 4, beginning to read from verse 13. It was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who live by law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless, because law brings wrath, and where there is no law there is no transgression. Therefore the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Okay, in today's lesson we follow the pattern of Abraham's faith as exemplary of the faith of the true believer in the 21st century. So far in Romans we have learned that salvation is by faith alone through grace and apart from any human works. 
Now, Paul goes into greater detail concerning the nature of Abraham's justification by faith in order to make clear the inadequacy of works in contrast to the complete adequacy of the plan God has instituted. Now, in this section of the passage, God's promise dominates. The Community Bible Study, which is a commentary, says, Like a cool spring in a wasteland, it offers refreshment and hope to those who travel by faith. But for those who travel by the law of works and self-sufficiency, the promise vanishes like a mirage in the horizon. Now, in verse 13, we read about the distinction of Abraham's faith. Verse 13 is a restatement of all that we studied last week. God's promise is independent of the law and rests squarely on the pr principle of faith. Paul shows the impossibility of justification by means of the law when he writes these words in Galatians 3.17. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. Since all God's dealing with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob happened before the giving of the Mosaic law, we can't say they were based on the law. Instead, they are based on God's declaration of Abraham's righteousness through faith. Faith is the ground of God's blessing. Abraham was a blessed man indeed because he became heir of the world on another principle, entirely simple faith. Paul has made it clear that justification is not based on ceremony because Abraham was justified by faith at least 14 years before he was circumcised. Not based on conduct either because the law was given to Moses 430 years after Abraham was justified. So Paul mentions three consequences of seeking justification by the law. First consequence of seeking justification by the law, he says, the principle of faith is replaced. Verse 14, for if those who live by law are heirs, faith has no value. Paul says that if the inheritance is predicated upon obedience, then faith has no value. The Greek word he used is the word kekinotia, which means to be emptied of its validity. Faith is able to receive anything God promises. If on the other hand, God's promise is only to be received through obedience to a law, which neither uh, Abraham nor his uh, children uh, could keep, then faith is cancelled. In other words, to predicate a promise on an impossible condition is to nullify the promise. The second consequence of seeking justification by the law is that the promise of God is revoked. Verse 14 again. And the promise is worthless. Now Paul states that striving to be God's heir on the basis of law annuls the promise. Paul uses the Greek word katargetia which means to destroy or render ineffective. John Stott explains something can be given to us either by law or by promise, since God is the author of both, but they cannot be in operation simultaneously. The third, consequences, the third consequence of seeking justification uh, by the law is the punishment of wrath is received. Verse 15, because law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. The law brings wrath. When people look to the law for life instead to God, when they look to the law for justification, they find instead that failure to keep the law makes them guilty. And instead of life, they face death. James chapter 2 verse 10 says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Romans 3.20 Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. One more time. Why do we have the law if it is not for justification? Galatians 3.19 says this. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. <clears throat> 
verse 24 of uh, Galatians chapter 3 says, So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come. We are no longer under the supervision of the law. So in verses 13 to 15, Paul tells us that faith is not trying to obey and fulfill some kind of law. It is not doing your best to try to live up to a standard that you think you ought to live up to. That is the law. And no matter what the law is or where it came from, trying your best to live up to it is not faith. In that case, Paul points out that you are not living by faith. You are living by works. Faith is not expecting God to accept and love you simply because you have tried your best to obey some standard. In fact, if you live on those terms, you will find that you cannot receive what God wants to give you. Abraham is proof that this method will never bring you the gift of righteousness. If you think that God is going to accept and love and forgive you because you have tried hard to do what you think is right, you are on the wrong track. In verses 16 to 17, we read the definition of Abraham's faith, which will be very necessary for us to understand our definition of faith as we have it today. The first thing about the definition of Abraham's faith is the principle of Abraham's faith. And the principle of Abraham's faith is grace. Verse 16. Therefore the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace. Abraham's faith was not in itself righteousness, but was reckoned to him as righteousness on the basis of the one who would himself graciously provide for believers, including Abraham, the righteousness they could never attain by themselves. The second definition of Abraham's faith is that Abraham's faith was the promise of certainty. The promise of Abraham's faith was about the certainty. Verse 16, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. When the promise is of faith, then it can be certain. But if it is of the law, then it is uncertain. Listen to the words of Donald Gray Barnhouse. He says the law is the womb of doubt and anyone who is attached to the law or its works is going to be besieged by all of the doubts which are born from the law. The man who walks by the law walks in the night and his footsteps echo against the wall of the darkness that goes with the law. But the man who walks by the promise of grace walks in the broad way, broad day. His footsteps echo against the light of the promises of God and he feels himself to be surrounded by the angels of blessings. The third definition of Abraham's faith is that the potential of Abraham's faith was universality. In verse 16 to 17, Paul says that Abraham would be the heir of the world. That is the meaning of the expression Abraham being the father of many nations. When he uses this expression, he taps into the tradition that had grown up around the name of Abraham. But Paul went way beyond the traditions of the Jews. He saw the prophecy concerning Father Abraham in its worldwide focus. God's promise, which was given to a solitary pilgrim some 3,500 years ago, has not expired nor has it become the private possession of one race of humanity. It is like yeast permeating the lump, laying hold of the entire world. Then we read also about the person of Abraham's faith was Christ. Now that is a very thrilling definition of Abraham's faith. The person of Abraham's faith was Christ. In verse 17, the second part of it, we read that faith must always be centered in a person not in a thing. And Christian faith always rests upon the person of Jesus Christ himself. We must never get caught up in faith itself. However, for faith that is not wedded to Christ is just a vague feeling and nothing more. Abraham believed in the God of resurrection. Verse 17, it says he believed the God who gives life to the dead. At this point in history, there had been no recorded resurrection from the dead. 
neither had God revealed any doctrine of resurrection. But Abraham believed that God could give life to the dead. He evidenced that belief in regard to the deadness of both his and Sarah's bodies. And later when Abraham was asked to take Isaac's life, he concluded that God could raise Isaac from the dead. Hebrews 11, 11 and 12. And by faith even Sarah, who was past childbearing, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. If you read the same chapter of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 and 19, it says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Abraham also believed in the God of creation and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So in Romans 4.17, we read that Abraham also believed in the God of creation. He believed in a God who could create out of nothing. God took the nothingness of Sarah's womb and the deadness of Abraham's body and out of them he brought forth Isaac, the son of promise. Now, so much so about the definition of Abraham's faith. Now, let's look at the description of Abraham's faith in verses 18 to 22. Now, there are six characteristics of Abraham's faith. In verse 18, we find the first characteristic. Abraham's faith conquered impossibility. That's the first characteristic of Abraham's faith, which is an exemplary faith for a modern believer today. Abraham had hope when there was no human reason to have hope. John Calvin put it this way, The meaning is that when he had no grounds for hope, Abraham still relied in hope on the promise of God. In spite of the lack of human hope, Abraham believed God when he took Abraham outside and said, He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Now, in the words of Kent Hughes, he weighed the human impossibility of becoming a father against the divine impossibility of God being able to break his word and decided that if God was God, nothing was impossible. Against all hope, Abraham believed. Abraham's faith conquered impossibility. The second characteristic of Abraham's faith, which is an exemplary faith for the modern believer, is in verse 19. Abraham's faith conquered improbability. Verse 19 says, And not being weak in faith, for 25 years Abraham believed God without any specific evidence of the promise. His faith was sustained. He did not become weak in his faith when time elapsed between the promise and the expected fulfillment. Leon Morris says this, We must not overlook the fact that many years passed between the giving of the promise in verse 5 of chapter 15 of the book of Genesis and its fulfillment in Genesis 21 verse 2. Abraham must have been sorely tired by the delay as he saw Sarah and himself growing old and beyond the human capacity of producing a child. Paul is referring to the settled attitude that endured all this. Abraham's faith conquered all forms of improbability. The third characteristic of Abraham's faith is again found in verse 19. It says Abraham's faith conquered inadequacy. In verse 19 we read this. He did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Genesis 17, 21 My covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Martin Luther caught the irony of God's promise to Abraham and saw in it a picture of our faith as well. 
when he describes the following. What could be more irrational and laughable, ridiculous and impossible than God's words to Abraham? Moreover, all the articles of our Christian belief are, when considered rationally, just as impossible and mendacious and preposterous. Faith, however, is completely abreast of the situation. It grips reason by the throat and strangles the beast. It affects what the whole world and all that is in its impotent to do. But how can faith do this? By holding on to God's word and by accounting it right and true, however stupid and impossible it may appear. By this means did Abraham imprison his reason and in the same fashion do all other believers who have entered the dark recess of faith throttle reason saying, Listen, reason, thou blind and stupid fool that understandeth not of the things of God. Seize thy tricks and chattering, hold thy tongue and be still, venture no more to criticize the word of God. So that's so much about Abraham's faith conquering inadequacy. The fourth characteristic is in verse 20. We read that Abraham's faith conquered inconsistency. Abraham did not waver in his faith. That is, he did not vacillate back and forth between believing God and not believing God. His faith stayed firm. At times he admitted that he did not understand how God was going to keep his promise, but he never doubted. Abraham is a great encouragement to us who believe but often do not understand. The writer of Hebrews reminds us that godly faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews verse 1. The fifth characteristic of Abraham's faith which is exemplary for the modern believer is in verse 20. We read that Abraham's faith conquered insecurity. Abraham gave God the glory, even though he succumbed to Sarah's pressure to go and to Hagar, he eventually realized that no human effort could fulfill the promise that God had given to him. And he looked to God alone for the promise of Isaac, the promised son. Faith looks past the gift of the giver and past the promise to the promiser. Faith looked past the gift to the giver and past the promise to the promiser. The sixth characteristic of the exemplary faith for a modern believer through the example of Abraham's faith is verse 21. We read that Abraham's faith conquered infidelity. The faithfulness of Abraham fully persuaded and the faithfulness of God able to perform come together in this verse. Abraham believed God. Looking back over Paul's description of Abraham's faith, these expressions grab our attention of chapter 4 of the book of Romans verse 19. Not being weak in faith. That is Paul's description of Abraham's faith. Verse 19 says, not being weak in faith. Verse 20, did not waver at the promise. Verse 20 again, was strengthened in faith. Further down in verse 20, giving glory to God. Verse 21, being fully convinced and he was also able to perform. Abraham had no hesitation and no reservation in his faith. Abraham had no hesitation and no reservation in his faith. God's ability was the foundation of his faith stability. God's ability was the foundation of Abraham's faith stability. Verse 23 to 25, we read finally about the deduction of Abraham's faith. Romans 4, 23 to 25 presents the basic gospel in condensed form. Martin Luther said of these verses, In these verses, the whole of Christianity is comprehended. Paul concludes this chapter on Abraham's faith with a dynamic application to all of us. He wants to see how this Old Testament story impacts our lives. The deduction that he makes and that we are to make is this. We today are justified by faith in the exact same way as Abraham was. A basic understanding of Abraham 
as the precursor to all those who would gain entrance to the eternal kingdom by faith in God was not foreign to some believing Jews of Christ's time and the apostles day. That is why when Jesus told the story of the rich man and uh, poor Lazarus uh, in Luke chapter 16, the place where justified Lazarus went upon his death was Abraham's bosom or Abraham's side. It was the false religious system of the Pharisees that corrupted an understanding of justification by faith to the point that many of Christ's day believed that entrance into the eternal kingdom would be by personal righteousness according to the law rather than by faith like Abraham's. Faith, a simple thing, but hard for many to comprehend. Many people are confused on the subject of faith. Some think that faith is nothing but a mental assent to a truth, that if you believe a thing is true, then you are exercising faith. But faith is more than simply believing something is true. If you have a God who can raise things from the dead and who can call into existence the things that do not exist, you are going to be a very exciting person to live with. You will never know when a thing that is dead and dull and lifeless may be touched by the grace of God and brought to life again. When something that you cannot possibly hope for, something which does not now exist, but which will be called into existence by the God who calls you into existence of things that do not exist, when such a thing is promised by a God like this, life is an adventure. That is faith. When all things are yours, do you have that kind of God? There is the faith of Abraham. How did he deal with these staggering possibilities? It is unbelievable that all nations should be blessed through them. He would be heir of the world. He would be called the friend of God. Could it be? But Abraham remembered that he had a God who gives life to the dead and a God who calls into existence things that do not exist and so he believed if you really want to know what faith is you have to see it in action so the exemplary faith of the contemporary believer in the light of what we studied should be as follows our faith should conquer impossibilities in accordance with God's will our faith should conquer improbability our faith will conquer inadequacy our faith should conquer inconsistencies. Our faith will conquer insecurity. And our faith will conquer infidelity. Abraham never doubted that God would fulfill his promise. Abraham's life was marked by mistake. It was marked by sins and failures as well by wisdom and goodness. But he constantly trusted God. His faith was strengthened by the obstacles he faced and his life was an example of faith in action. If he had looked only at his own resources for subduing Canaan and founding a nation, he would have given up in despair. But Abraham looked to God, obeyed him and waited for God to fulfill his word. All right, that's all for this evening. I would now love to have your reflections and interactions on the subject that we studied. If there be, please do interact.